Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and tuning in this weekend. My name is JJ Matai and I'm one of the worship pastors here at Jubilee Fellowship Church. I get the honor and the privilege of welcoming you to our online service here right now. If you're new here and you've never been here before or you're new, a couple of services watching, we would love to connect with you. We're not coming after you, we're not coming to your house. We just want to know you and connect with you to get you more connected to what's going on at our church. If you go to jfc.org new, we have a quick card you could fill out and you even get a gift in the mail sent to you just for doing that. What could be better than that? If you're part of this community at all in any way, we would love for you to be a part of our commenting during the service. It's a way for you to stay connected with other people watching online since you're not in the building, but certainly a part of the whole of the community. Finally, in every way and everything that's happening in our church, we just wanna draw everybody together in whatever way connects you. We have three easy ways that you could give to be a part of the bigger kingdom vision that our church has to share Jesus with people. So however you come here, however you want to be a part of it, we would love for you to connect with us, and I will see you at the end of the service. Good morning. Welcome. How's everybody doing today? So glad you're here. What a great day to be here. The baptisms, oh, just something about that. And, and, and believe me, little children can know all about Jesus and understand what this is about. I remember as a child, as a young child, understanding God's love for me and wanting him to be in my heart. So when these kids come up, oh, it just gets me. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to do a two-week series called Crazy Makers. Pastor John will be back uh, next week to finish this series. Then we jump into our Christmas series. Uh, so this series, Crazy Makers, the people that make you crazy. Are we going to have fun with this? Wait till the sermon. You may not think so. I wrote my own list, okay, real short. I had more, but I kept it simple. People that drive slow in the fast lane. Yeah, come on. If you're in your Subaru and you're there, get off the road. I'm just telling you. There's a whole story there. I won't tell you today. People running red lights. I am not kidding you. I don't know what happened. I think we got colorblind drivers. The yellow between the green and the red means to actually slow down, not speed up and try to get through that. I'm just telling you. People who sit, this I experienced yesterday, so I added it. People who sit on a workout machine and take pictures of themselves. There was a cute little girl yesterday on the machine. I needed to get to work and get here, and she's sitting there and doing all these little face things. And, you know, some of these things just... Help me, Jesus. I probably should have sat by her and said, let me be in your picture. She would have moved, I guarantee you. All right, this one's good. People who kick the back seat of my airline seat. Drives me crazy. Politicians. Narrow-minded people. Oh, sorry, those are one and the same. Okay, those are fairly generic, but I really began to think of specific people. I put a list together. <laughs> My wife, Nancy. How many of you, your spouse drives you crazy? <laughs> Guys, let me just tell you, you should not have raised your hand. <laughs> Jim Schoenfelter. <laughs> Doug Wilson. <laughs> Cindy Holloway. She's my admin. <laughs> Larry Murfield. Paul Fortson. Um, it's too long. I'm not going to do that. But anyway, actually, many of those are the most wonderful people. And truthfully, I probably drive them crazy, especially my wife and Cindy. Cindy worked real hard. We had our life plus. How many were at breakfast this morning? Wasn't that great? We had some good food. Uh, Josh, I don't know if he's in here. Josh uh, cooked up some pancakes and stuff. And then uh, Cindy put together uh, 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 the, all the games, and then we had people bringing food. Listen, if you're 60, between 60 and 70 and up and, and young at heart, uh, we do this uh, on uh, every other month basis, and uh, you're missing a great event. We had a lot of fun. People won prizes. It was really good. So anyway, so truthfully, crazy makers, in this message today, uh, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to tell you what, the people that really make me church people. They make me crazy. Okay. Now, I, I was saved at an early age. I was raised in the church. I've been in the church for 65 years. Okay. 
It's a long time. Yes. I was trying to think how many actual church services I've been in. And I, I, this is a, just a, a small estimate. I've been over, in over 7,000 church services in those 65 years. As a kid, we used to do a pin that if you made it every Sunday, you got a pin for your lapel that said uh, perfect attendance. Okay, and not mine, we always won those things. All right, like it or not. Um, the point being is that I think that honestly, I can come before you today with really a good understanding of church people. I, I am one, and yet I'm around them all the time, and I'm telling you why they drive me crazy. Now, there are three types of crazy makers that I'm going to talk about today in the church. I want to make clear to you, this is not a message of condemnation. My heart and my prayer has been that you come here today, open up your heart and say, God, you speak to me. Show me where I'm at. Show me what I need to do. Show me how I need to be more passionate and involved and excited and experiencing Jesus in my life. Pastor John always asks us when we put together a message is that, well, what's your one statement? All right. And my one statement for this is that I want to show everyone here, church people, how to live a better way in Jesus. How many want an abundant life? Yes. Okay. Let me just tell you, we all want it, but getting there is a little bit of a journey, correct? All right. This process I'm going to talk about today isn't easy. All right. So let me just prepare you at the end of this service. I'm going to do something outside the box. I want you to just be taken in this message, but I want you to be ready to know that at the end of the service, there's a moment of consecration that's going to take place. I'm going to challenge you right now to be bold, to if you really want to experience Jesus, to be ready to make a step in that direction. Now, the first uh, group of church people that drive me, drive me crazy are hypocrites. That's a harsh word, isn't it? Hypocrite. Okay. All right. Let me tell you what the uh, dictionary says. A person who claims or pretends to have certain beliefs about what is right, but who behaves in a way that disagrees with those beliefs. Now, let's be honest. How many of you admit you're a hypocrite? If you run yellow lights, the law says, slow down, and you go through a red, you're a hypocrite. Okay? I'm a law-abiding citizen. No, you're not. I'm sorry. I'm off on that. I I got hit the other day. It's in my soul. I'm ready to talk about that. So anyway, um, uh, years ago, uh, our son, Jeremiah, I don't know if Jeremiah's here. I'm, I'm looking to see if he's here today. Um, he, uh, he graduated and, and, and went on his way. And he said, Dad, he left church. You know, and as a pastor, as a as Christian dad, that's a hard thing. And so I said, well, what's, what's your reasoning? He said, Dad, church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. Now, I wasn't surprised with that. <laughs> I'd been pastor for many years. But to a young man, his statement was, Dad, I don't want to be in the church until I'm ready to be all in. And he went on a 10-year prodigal journey and came back. And I can proudly say as his dad, he's all in. He's raising his kids. He's loving Jesus. All right? I'm proud of that. Okay? But the point made to my heart then as a pastor is that we have a hypocrite problem in our church. We have people that say this about God but live this way. And it's a very real problem in our culture, in our society today. I might even use this word if you don't like the word hypocrite. How about half-hearted? Does that make you feel better now? (laughs) Half-hearted Christians. All right. I'm going to talk about what that looks like. Now, uh, I got to tell you just a good romantic story. Okay. How many of you have been watching the Hallmark Christmas movies? No, I watch them. I'm sorry. We talk about it and joke about it every year. It's the same plot, just a different city, just a different country house. Just, you know, if you watch closely, they use the same decorations in all them dumb movies. <laughs> just telling you, it's real. So uh, several years ago, uh, I, 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 I meet this girl named Nancy. And so uh, I wanted to marry her. And so I thought through about this proposal. And, and, and honestly, I, I had this little uh, cosmetic ring and, and I, I, I gave that to her as a proposal. And what she didn't know is that uh, I'd, I'd, I'd set this up and said, look, it, we're going to go to dinner, and I've got this great setup at Maggiano's. They've got a special romantic seating package for us, and we're going to go. And so she got all real pretty and dressed up, and so uh, we're driving there, and, and she, she's holding this little cosmetic ring, looking at it. I think she was thinking, this guy's cheap. Uh, <laughs> But she was looking at it, and, and, and she said, you know, I haven't said yes yet. 
Now, what she did not know, and some of you were there, is that I had planned a surprise proposal party. I wanted to increase the odds of a yes. So I had her, her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend, some of her coworkers, some of my kids, uh, many of my great friends here. And so Amy uh, and Pastor John really helped me set this thing up. And so in this back room of Maggiano, we had about 40 people. All right. So we get to the host and, and I said, my name's Terry. Oh, we have a nice table set up for you. A little romantic thing. And, and it's hard to fool Nancy. She's very, very smart. But man, this was working real good. All right. So uh, we go to this room. The door opens. Everybody's there standing, yelling, yay, proposal party and all sorts of crazy things. Run, run. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we get there, and Pastor John had helped me uh, meet with Steve. I don't know if Steve's in here. Steve Williams, Jeweler. We found this real nice setting. Now, Nancy actually had a diamond uh, that was given to her in a necklace uh, several years ago, and she kept it. It's a very, very exquisite diamond. All right. And on my application for marriage, I, I had to ask every woman, do you have your own diamond? Because I didn't have any money. And so Nancy had her own diamond, so she won. Uh, that's the reason. <laughs> So uh, we had, we had a, a setting, uh, uh, one of the fake diamonds, I don't know what they're called, zirconium, whatever, uh, put in there and it, it looked really pretty. And so Pastor John, Nancy was still in shock with all these people. Pastor John walked up behind me my, and he handed me uh, the, the box because I didn't want to have a big old box in my pocket. Guys, that's a dead giveaway if you're going to propose. So anyway, I take this box and I get down on one knee and I said, would you marry me? I think we got a picture of that. She waited. As, as long as you're watching this picture, it took her to answer. No, actually, she, she, she didn't have a choice. Everybody was there. So she said yes, probably thinking I'll get out of this later, but, but I would not let her out. She's a woman of her word. So anyway, but, but let me tell you this. Okay, that was an epic proposal. She said yes. A couple months later, we got married in Jerusalem, amazing experience. Uh, and so going on four years, loving it, uh, learning how to be a, a, a married and all the wonder stuff that comes with that, uh, driving each other crazy, but that's another sermon. And so anyway, I want you to picture this proposal, another epic proposal, all right? Let's say, men, you go to a woman and you say these kinds of things. Will you marry me? But... I kind of want other girlfriends. I want some other lovers. Okay. And here's some more stuff you need to be aware of. I probably won't talk to you very often. All right. And don't expect any financial support from me. All right. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of live my life, do my thing. All right. Uh, but I expect you to be faithful. I expect you to meet all my needs. I expect you to love me. All right. Is that a yes? No. How many women would take that proposal? I don't see any hands. Okay. If you raise your hand, you are definitely crazy. I'm just telling you right now. How often is that our relationship with God? He comes to us with this amazing proposal. I will forgive you of your sins. I will love you. I will walk with you through life. I will make a place for you in eternity. And what do we say? Well, okay, God, but I've kind of got a few rules of my own. I'll, I'll come to church every now and then. I'll, I'll maybe read the Bible. Every now and then when I'm in trouble, I'll pray. I won't be faithful to you. I'll have other lovers in this world. This is what I'm talking about is, is a hypocrite, a half-hearted person. Okay? Now, I've been a hypocrite here. All right? And this idea of a belief and a behavior is very important. And promise you, by the end of this message, I'm going to give you an understanding how to change that with great joy and great power. All right? I am a hypocrite just as much as the people I'm talking to here. There have been seasons in my life where I did not treat God the way that I should have. I chose sinful choices and paths. How did I get there? I got there by getting away from the source. I decided I didn't need to read my Bible. 
I didn't need to pray. There was a period in my life after losing Brenda where I just kind of just got disconnected from God. And it was a very dark, terrible time. I'd come to church. You don't have to be here, but I have to be here, David. We have to be here. That's kind of a job requirement, isn't it? But I was going through the motions, and I was just in a life of sinfulness. And God was good, and he drew me back. And I pray that draw, God will draw you back if you're in that place today. Yes. But I want to share a little story about this idea of half-hearted, halfway Christianity. Matthew says this in chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus replied, and he's really capturing all of what the Old Testament law was about. The Ten Commandments all comes down to this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. David, you are a business pastor. How many alls are in that verse? Three. Give the man a hand. We're in good hands for sure. Is there any other room in there for anything else in what Jesus commands from us? It does not read, don't love the Lord with just a little of your heart. Don't with a little of your soul, maybe halfway of your mind. God has asked us and there's a purpose he's asked us to that. It isn't for his benefit, it's for our benefit. So let me take you through this thing. Peter, Jesus comes to him. All right, he's a fisherman. He says, come, follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. What did Peter do? He followed Jesus. All right, I love the Chosen series and it shows Peter as this great character. Now listen, I want to make sure you understand this. Peter was not a perfect guy. Peter made a lot of mistakes, but Peter was all in. All right, all into a fault. All in where he made a lot of mistakes. I'd rather church people be all in and making mistakes than halfway in. And so he's walking this life. He's all in with Jesus. He's not fully understanding really what Jesus is about. And Pastor John did a great message last week on Peter and regret. Go back and hear that if you hadn't heard that. So there's one starting example of what Jesus did. In Jesus' time, another person came up to Jesus. The Bible describes him as a rich young ruler. He's a young man with lots of wealth. And he says to Jesus, what must I do to get eternal life? Here was Jesus' response. Go and sell your possessions, then come and follow me. Half-hearted. This is what the Bible says. He heard that and he went away sad because he was rich. When you follow Jesus wholeheartedly, it's going to cost you. It's going to require some things from you that require giving some things up. All right. So this happens. Jesus follows that story. All right. And they're talking about this rich young ruler. <clears throat> and it said that, you know, he, he walked away from eternity. So Peter's having this conversation right after that. And Peter says, all right, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. <clears throat> now understand, he didn't know the full scope of what that meant, but at that point, he understood he was all in. So here's, what, here's what's important. Jesus said to his disciples, and I'm, I'm summarizing this, sit you by following me and being faithful will sit on 12 thrones over the tribes of Israel in eternity. <clears throat> and then he goes on speaking, and he said to all my followers, everyone who has left, and he mentions these things, houses, families, work for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. The problem is perception because we think I want what this world has. I want my life, my choices, and a little of Jesus, and that's going to placate it and make it work. It does not work because God is something far greater for you. All right? So we talked about this, and Pastor John actually did mention this last week. In Matthew 13, it talks about the seeds. Now listen, there's a theme going through this story of these people that were either wholehearted or half-hearted. In the seed story, it says the cares of life and wealth will choke out and make it unfruitful. There's a value and a benefit for you being wholehearted because there should be fruit in your life. And it speaks of 30, 60, and 100 fold. And then, all right, he talks about this idea of those that hear the word and understands the word, you'll have a crop of 30, 60, and 100 times as well in a different passage. 
All right, one last verse I want to talk to you about. In John chapter 6, it's a very sobering experience. Jesus was doing these amazing miracles, the kind, Kathy, that we believe God is going to do here, healing people, delivering people, amazing things. How many would like to follow that? All right, Jesus was given a lot of food, free lunch. How many like free lunch? Okay, and not just, you know, in and out. It's like, here's some fishes, and they just kept multiplying. I want to see that again and again. They were all following him for those reasons. And Jesus comes to this point. And understand the significance of this. He's saying to them, okay, to follow me, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. In essence, what he's saying, you need to be all in. You can't be here for the free lunch. You can't be here for the miracles. Those are things that I do, but you have to be here for me. And they did not. The Bible says many of the crowds then quit following Jesus and walked away. I think it happens today. I think we experience that today. So let me bring this down to this point. Revelation, a letter written to the church people in chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Here's what's written. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. (coughs) Now, spit you out of my mouth. I don't know there if it's better to say as a pastor, get in or get out. That's not really my heart. But there's a very important reason that you need to be all in. Okay, and I'm going to explain at the end what that looks like. Okay, so why do hypocrites drive me crazy? I'm going to use these mirrors. Yeah. Yeah. Got a haircut. How do you like my haircut anyway? Okay, so here's what I want to do, okay? <clears throat> Let me do it this way. <coughs> when you do, and I'll talk more about brain science, but basically, and you understand it's a simple principle, okay? We become what we worship or attach to. So how many Bronco fans are here today? Okay, many of you have Bronco shirts. You watch the game, you cheer, you get excited, you get depressed, whatever happens, Okay. Uh, a friend of mine inter- invited me to the Avalanche game, and, and I, I don't really follow hockey. I, it's great. I love the Avalanche. They're a good team. I, I, I just I don't follow hockey, and, and so I'm not really necessarily attached to hockey. And so uh, he did these great seats right on the front row there, or whatever you call it in hockey, and he invited me, and I went to the, uh, the store to get an Avalanche shirt. And you know what? I'm standing there looking at how expensive Avalanche shirts are. And I really realized I'm not that big a fan. <clears throat> so I got this shirt instead, half price. This is a better deal for me, okay? All right, the point being is that if you look at your life, we become what we are worshiping or attra- attached to or attracted to. So I want to use these mirrors as an illustration, okay? Here's what happens, okay? Your life, all the things that hinder you, that keep you from being full in. You can describe your life. I don't know what it is. It could be sports. It could be your kids. It could be your pursuits of success. It could be your vacation. All of those are good things, but not good things if that's all what your life is about. So your reflection is going to be in that mirror. But because you're church people that are driving me crazy, you bring in a little bit of Jesus. Now, can you see what's happening here? You're creating in this mirror, in these mirrors, two identities. And you are wondering sometimes why it doesn't make sense. And deep down in your heart, there's days where you're wondering, is this worth it? And a lot of people get depressed because this does not work right, because this is not as important as it should be. So you're here today and you're half-hearted and you're going through life double-minded, double-imaged, and no clear identity. The value and the benefit of being wholehearted is what I'm going to point out at the end of this message. All right. What do you gain with being wholehearted? The Bible speaks 30, 60, 100 times. Now, let me just tell you something. Quick story. I didn't see if my dad's here today. My dad, uh, uh, at his mother's deathbed, she was dying. 
She prayed a prayer. She prayed a prayer that they would come to know Jesus, her kids. And uh, dad was a young boy and, and just went the way of the world. And he's playing cards one day, all right? And he's smoking a cigar, playing cards and, and drinking. My dad had addictive issues. Uh, my mom and dad were separated at that time, uh, having a lot of issues. And so he's playing cards, smoking cigars, and all of a sudden this huge weight was on his chest. It felt like an elephant was sitting on him. And literally my dad thought he was going to die. And he remembered his mother's prayer. I want you to know Jesus. And he leaves the card game. He finds a church that was meeting. He sat in the service, much like this. He heard the gospel preached, and he couldn't stop running down and said, I want Jesus to have all of me. Now, what the beautiful thing is that he called my mom. Back then, for all the young people, they had these little uh, things that went on a wall or in a booth called a phone. Okay? You had to find one. And he went and he put in his dime and he called mom and said, look it, our life's a mess, but something's happened. I want you to know. She was raised Lutheran. Uh, This little Pentecostal church scared the fire out of her, but she came because something was happening that God was drawing. They went to church. She said, I want Jesus too. From that moment on, my dad and my mom was all in. And they raised us that way. They weren't perfect parents, but they were faithful to show us and to demonstrate and the model for us all in faith. Now, I will tell you, sometimes as a teenager, got to go to church again. This is the eighth time this week. (laughs) Felt like it. It's easy to be five. I mean, we had Sunday school, we had church, we had Sunday night church, we had prayer meetings, Wednesday night service. Yeah, it might have been eight. (laughs) But in my home, what my parents lived out at church was lived out at home. We had times of family devotion. When situations come up, serious situations, I saw my mom and dad praying. I walked by my mom's room one night and I'm a teenager and I'm struggling with some issues in my life and I heard my name. And on her knees, crying out a prayer for me. And the situation I was facing was instantly changed. Let me just say, what are the benefits of wholehearted? The Bible says 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. My heart is sad and it is crazy when I see so many church people just trying to skate the world, skate with Jesus, a little bit of here, a little bit of there, and never fully experience all that God has for you. Today could be a day that you see that changed. Now, I will tell you, I know that there are people sitting here today. I know. Okay. <laughs> there, there are a bunch of people looking around like saying, I am glad I am not one of those people. Because, and let me give you a new word, because I got my halo on. You're a halo, people. You are better than the rest of us. You are so good with God. You do all the things that you're supposed to do. And the Bible has a word for that. It's called a Pharisee. Now, I just made a lot of people mad right now. Listen, because of all the time I've spent, I've seen the half-hearted, but I've also seen in Pharisees the hard-hearted. It's all about the rules. It's all about the law. It's all about judging people's spirituality. Can I tell you, we're all in a different place in our walk and our experience with God. And Pharisees tend to put themselves on this pedestal and say, hey, look at how good I am. Look at how much I do for God. Now, I'm telling you, that's a real deal, okay? I will tell you of a woman when I was pastoring in South Carolina. You'll know who she is, Jake. She came to our church. They moved there from uh, Texas. They were in a really good church in San Antonio. And she came in. And within a few weeks, she wanted an appointment. New people wanted to hear their story, wanted to meet, and was excited to, you know, have people in our little church coming. And so she came in and she said, you know, we've been going here for three weeks. And and I've put together a list of things that you're doing wrong. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm good to learn stuff. And she went through her whole list of rules and her idea of God, her ideas of church, okay? 
Well, listen, at my old church, this is how we did that. Now, a lot of us pastors hear that. I hope you have come into this church not running from another church situation. And I hope you've come to this church from some church that, for whatever reason, God has brought you here. All right? And, and we know that many of you have left really good churches. And, and we know and we believe and we strive to be a good church, too. Because we want to really honor Jesus in that. Amen. All right? But here's what I'm saying. She went through all this. But let me tell you more about this woman, okay? It's Mother's Day. That's a little church. You've got about 200 people. I'm kind of homey. You guys that know me, I'm kind of warm and fuzzy guy. <clears throat> John Forsyth, you don't have to laugh that big, I'm telling you. <clears throat> so I wanted it to be a Mother's Day that just kind of had a real nice sentiment. So I made the mistake, never again, of saying, hey, why don't you stand up and give a tribute for your mom? Okay, three or four people stood up, really beautiful things about mom, just unbelievable stuff. And this woman's daughter stood up. Oh, to my surprise, how much she hated her mother. And she proceeded for the next five minutes to describe what a wretched, miserable person her mother was. Now, if you ever want to kill a Mother's Day service, find that person who hates their mother and let them have a testimony. <laughs> the eye doctor in the community went to our church. The receptionist went to our church. So obviously she asked, well, who's the eye doctor? And we told her, and she went not knowing her. <laughs> and so she went, and, and, and the doctor and his uh, receptionist didn't want anybody to know that she went to their church. Because she came in, she was the most, she had dragged her nose along the ceiling. And she was so much better than everybody else. And she made everybody else. And they hated her coming. Okay? About six months into them coming to the church, being a constant pain in my uh, derriere. She said, would like you over for dinner. <sighs> dinner. I like dinner. You know, sometimes as pastors, you do things sacrificially. <laughs> so we went to dinner, and, and, and there she proceeded to tell Brenda, I want you to be my best friend. What she wanted was an end to the pastoral structure. Now Brenda said, no, um, you're not going to be my best friend. Made her mad, threatened to leave the church. We were praying, oh, God. After dinner, she left to go to the other room. Her husband, she'd been berating him all night, berating, berating him. He was overweight, very unhealthy, ate a lot that night. And she left and she said to me, I hate this woman and I'm going to keep eating until I die. I kind of thought he was just kidding. <laughs> Two years later, he died. Now, that's a hardcore Pharisee, and I'm not comparing you to that. But that shows you the extreme of what it looks like when you're Pharisaical. Now, look at if you really want to do a deep dive into this, read Matthew 23. Jesus has a whole chapter there where he's really talking about Pharisaical attitudes. Hard-hearted people. Now, listen. Please understand this. Pharisees knew the law. They were sincere. They worked very hard. They were protectors of the law. All those things can be good until it crosses over a line. Now, these are people who knew the Bible, but they were legalistic in that. They see themselves as more important. We find this in Matthew 23. To them, image is everything. To tell you the truth, I've been a halo. There were times in my life where I thought I was better than everybody else. I was raised in a church that fostered halos. It was a great church, don't get me wrong. People were passionate, they loved Jesus, but there were a lot of Pharisees. All right, we had Pharisae Pharisaical rules. All right, we grew up in a church that had a pledge card. All right, that pledge card, you had to check all the boxes and sign, I will not. Nothing about I will. You see, the kingdom of God opposite the Pharisees is a lot about I will and about a lot about freedoms. And so we go, and as a kid, I signed this card, uh, you know, to be a member, to be a part of the church. Uh, I won't smoke. I won't drink. I won't chew. I won't dance. I won't go to movies. And I'm a teenager thinking, what's left? I was real happy they didn't see kissing girls because, man, that was a cool thing. So let me just tell you, 
I was raised in that understanding that if you did all the rules, you were a better Christian than all the people that did not. That's hard-hearted. That's pharisaical. And the Lord brought me into an environment, I won't take time to tell the story, where all of a sudden I met people who were not pharisaical, who were not about rules, but so much in love with Jesus, it messed with my theology. And I will tell you, for several months I was thinking, how can these people be Christians? Because they, man, they did not fill out my card that I filled out. They, 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 man, they drink and they party and they have fun and they laugh and, 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 and they get down and they dance and all these kinds of things. Okay. Now I'm the guy that goes up to the bar and orders a drink for the girl. It's my wife. Just want you to know that. So you look at me, oh my goodness, pastor's buying drinks for women. One woman. Let me read you this passage in Luke chapter 18. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you. Luke chapter 18. Jesus told the story of some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. He said two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like the other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income, but the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this sinner, not the Pharisee, Return home justify, justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhaust, exalted. I am not the determiner of your eternity. Only God is. Only God knows your heart. There are times in Scripture I really struggle. In Mark, he talks about not everybody who does these miracles and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Can he be referencing Pharisees that don't really have a relationship? Can he be referencing half-hearted that really don't have? I don't know. And I'm glad that I don't know. That is not my job here today. My job is to point out what you need to know. All right. The thing with Pharisees is they have so much knowledge. They read the books. They study the Bible. But can I tell you what they don't have? They don't have understanding. Because the Bible talks about not only the law, Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law, all right? He didn't abolish it, but he's fulfilled it in that in him, the law is manifest. But he came with this agenda of love and passion for people. And he met with all of the sinners in his ministry. And often the Pharisees would hound him and harass him. Let me tell you, eventually they killed him. Pharisees have a way of killing now, I know that's strong. Please hear my heart. I've been a Pharisee. I know what it's like. But I also know the freedom and the joy of living in grace and love. And if you're here today and you struggle and you're looking at this and you're looking at that and you're thinking, well, the church isn't doing this right or those Christians aren't doing that right, that is not your place to judge. We are God's children. He is our Father. He judges that. Now, listen, if you're living in blatant sin, all right, Great, we can talk about that. But it's the Pharisee that's going to compare and not have compassion. Do you see the difference there? So let's come back to this. We become what we worship or attach to, okay? So if you're a Pharisee, you're all about the law, okay? So like earlier, you have this image of the law. You see yourself. You see a pretty good Christian in that mirror. Hey, man, that is a good Christian. Man, Man, I, I, God really is happy I'm on his team. He's really lucky to get me. And then you have a little bit of Jesus. Can I tell you, there's still two identities. One is religion. One, is one, one has enough Jesus to satisfy that spiritual itch, but there's still not one clear identity that God has for you. Okay? All right. I'm going to bring it down here. The third person that drives me crazy 
is what we call heathen. Heathen is a really w- rough word because it's been misused by Pharisees. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me just say this. Why do people who do not know God drive me crazy? Because I want so much them to know what I know about God. Family members, friends, neighbors, people who come into this church who need God. Back at the church in South Carolina, there was a bouncer. He's about 6'6", about 320. And it wasn't fat. It was big. The guy was big. He took up two seats. And he always wanted to sit. Now, listen, he's not a church guy. His wife came to know Jesus. All right? And she didn't know all the churchy Pharisee terms. We're, we're doing some modeling, remodeling at the church. We're painting one day. She was actually painting. A, and, 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 and listen, I won't use the religion. But a, but a church guy came in. And he was selling something. But he, anyway, he was one of those kind of hyper Pharisees. And he says to her, sister, have you been born again? Now, she didn't know what that meant. I don't know. What does born again mean? Have you a relationship with Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, that I do. And she began to tell how much she loved Jesus. She invites her husband, the big bouncer, to church. He loved his wife. He really did. She was, he was just honoring his wife. And he had sat at the back and he'd stretch his legs out. He always sat at the back because they're leg room. And I get that if you're tall, you know what I'm saying? And he'd fold his arms and he'd sit there. And it scared me. It scared me. I mean, I was like, man, this guy's a bouncer. If I make him mad, he'll kill me. But his Pat, wouldn't, his, Pat his wife, wouldn't let him. Can I tell you, for two years, he sat in the back there. He was faithful to come. One day we talked about how much Jesus loves people that are lost. And I ask, is there anybody here that would really like to know Jesus? Two years, this big old burly guy raises his hand. It was a good day. And I can tell you, he was all in. He was the most faithful, hardworking servant there is. Why? Because when Jesus changes your heart, you're all in. You can't do anything else because you love Jesus so much. And if you're here today and you've not experienced his forgiveness, from the beginning of the Bible, we find this beautiful story of sacrifice, blood sacrifice, that carries up to the final sacrifice of Jesus saying, once and for all, I've covered all your sins. So let me finish with this. I told you at the beginning, I wanted you to have an abundant life with Jesus. The Bible talks about, and I won't read the verse, but it's in John 15. He is the vine, we are the branches. In essence, what that says is that we are connected to the source. That apart from him, you cannot be a little Jesus. He's very clear about those that are not connected are cut off and those branches are burned. Be passionate about this abiding in him. So it comes back. Why? Why should you, if you're here today half-hearted, if you're here today hard-hearted, if you're here today without God, why? Why should we do this? Okay? What's the key? Remember I said we become what we worship. That's where our identity comes from. I met with Jim Wilder. He's a neurotheologian. He was here at our church uh, leadership uh, years ago. Uh, he had been back last year with uh, another guy that's very uh, written a book. And anyway, I was curious. And Jim lives here in Colorado. I was able to meet with him a couple weeks ago. And we talked about uh, how the brain works and what, what are the spiritual Im- Im- implications. And it really fit in with what I'm trying to say today. I'm going to share a little about that. Here's what he said. He's talking about his study of neurology in the brain. He said that within all of our brains, there is an identity center. And here's the thing he said. Our brains in that identity center cannot see who we are. I think God designed it this way. But it can only be seen in relationship to others. Do you understand what that says? 
Others are important to you. I could spend a lot of time here and I'm running out of time talking about how others in your life can shape how you see yourself. Whether it's children or spouse or friends, they can do that. Why is the body of Christ important? Because others see you and show you who you are. And it's very powerful. So in looking at all this, he says that the true way that brain creates transformation is by attachment. What you worship, what you're attached to, okay? And here's what he said. In all the studies, he said, it isn't that beliefs change behavior. We think that. We have programs that have behavior modification. I'm not knocking that, but I'm saying the best way is this idea of an attachment, all right, that then changes our behavior because we have a different identity. If you really understand the Bible, it says we are a new creation in Christ. When you get that, when you see that in that attachment with Jesus, you really get, I am a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Try to remember this. Spiritual formation is relational formation. You want to do it apart from relationship? You can't. So the design by God shows that our brain reflects those who we are attached to. And with that identity center in that area of our brain, it's loaded with what they refer to as mirror neurons. And more of those take place in your identity center than any other part of your brain. How God designed you in that place are these mirror neurons, all right? There's great, great importance in understanding that today. Direct interaction and modeling are needed for our brains to do what they were designed to do. Interaction and modeling, all right? Now, I'll give you a couple examples that just show this. I, I have a little grandbaby over here, Caitlin's little boy, six months almost, all right, uh, Nancy's watching him, and, and when I get to see him, uh, I don't scare him, luckily. I make faces, and he smiles, okay? Now, now, okay, in our advanced brain, we're kind of assuming certain things. But in essence, he mirrors. Now, in a good home, okay, that mirror reflection builds this self-worth, even as a baby. In a bad home where that kid is despised and resented for being there, there's a different mirror response. Do you understand that? Yes. Let me give you another example. Ever yawn when somebody yawns? I was going to yawn, but I've already seen enough of you during the sermon yawning, so I don't need any more of that. All right, so here's the key. I'm going to bring it down to this. He talks about this idea of direct interaction and attachment. So I've put up here, I hope it wasn't shining on you guys. Maybe it was. Anyway, Listen, can I, can I use this? This is all Jesus. This is all Jesus. When you have direct interaction and attachment, and where that comes from is how the Bible laid out, not to study the Bible to know things, but to study the Bible to know Jesus. Not to pray to do an exercise spiritual, but to know Jesus. Not to come to church just to fill a seat, but to know Jesus, not to write a check for tithe for some religious activity, but to further the work of Jesus. And when we get this and when we're all into this, it will change our life from half-hearted and hard-hearted to whole-hearted. And I don't know if you want that today, but I am praying and believing that that's the message that God wanted you to do. In, reflection, in reflecting our major attachments, this is the full image. This is what we are all in Christ. Not the little mirror, not the law, not the life, but all Jesus. I wrote this statement. Is it my life and Jesus? Or is it my life, all Jesus? Can I say that again? Is it my life and Jesus? Or is it my life, all Jesus? We're going to close here. I got a very special close today. Uh, I'm going to ask JJ to come up and get ready, okay? Let me share this. A couple weeks ago, I was praying about this message. I was, I was understanding kind of where the Lord had led me to go. And I very, felt very sure about this today, okay? Uh, it's not a message that we just sit around and say, hey, what do we want to talk about? Every one of our messages, every one of our teachers comes 
wanting to hear from God. We fit it in the context of a series and all that's fine. But we come in really wanting to hear from God. I was praying and worshiping a couple weeks ago and the old hymn came on, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. How many know that hymn? All right. In a moment, JJ is going to uh, lead us in that hymn. All right. But we're going to do this call to consecration. I'm going to take you way outside your comfort zone, but I'm doing it on purpose. There's intentionality here. It's easy and, and it's okay sometimes to have people raise a hand or challenge you to go out. All of those are true. All of those are good. But something in my soul today said, no, if we're going to be all in, we need to make a statement. It's not about a commitment. It's about surrender. It's about submission. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something powerful. Kathy, but I would like at this time all of your prayer team to get in place. Okay? So all of the prayer people, if you will get in the place, all right, they're going to be at the front. All right, but here's what we're going to do. And while JJ leads us in this course, what we're going to do is give you an opportunity to say, I'm going to be all in. Whether you've been hypocritical in your faith or halfway, whether you've been hard-hearted or pharisaical, today's the day to make it right with God. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Today's the day to say yes to God. So here's what we're going to do, okay? It's a call to consecration. As JJ leads in this great hymn, I'm going to ask you to step out. Maybe it's a proposal. Maybe the Bible says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Maybe I'm going to ask you today to come and make a proposal to God. And the way I'm going to do that is to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come forward and just line up here, okay? We're not going to make a big deal. I'm not going to plead. I'm not going to cajole. I'm just going to say, you're here. You know what God is saying to you. Now's the time to bend that knee, to make a step, to consecrate, and to ask God to help you in this. You are at a place in your life where you're ready for all Jesus. And the fruit of that is 30, 60, and 100 times. I mentioned earlier about my dad. The vast number of children from his family and generations all right, are full-time in church and ministry. All right, had my dad stayed on his course, I have no idea where I'd be today. I have no idea where my brothers and sisters would be today. But I know this, we're here today, all in on Jesus, because of somebody willing to come down to an altar. So today, I'm gonna ask you to stand. If there's one person or 100 person, I'm not here for a number. I'm here for people that are really, really serious about going all in with Jesus. Now, let me read this last verse, and then Jay's going to lead it, and then you're going to come. The last verse touched my heart when I was praying. It said, we're the whole realm, we're the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Here it is. Demands my soul, my life, my all when I survey the wondrous cross. That is life-changing, my friends. That is powerful. So as JJ leads us in three verses of this song, it's just three verses. Don't waste time. Be serious about God. Come up here. And then, all right, I'll have a prayer over you. And then if there's prayer that you need with healing or further prayer with these folks, they're available for you. All right, JJ, would you lead while people come? Please join us, folks. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My richest gain I count but loss And poor content on all my pride See from his head His hands His feet Sorrow and love Flow me Go down Dear Ever such love and sorrow me all thorns compose so rich a crown with the whole realm of nature. That we're praying.
I lift up all these crazy makers. And I ask God that this be a day where the reflection of their life would be about all Jesus. Lord, it is a process, and you have given victory to them today by making this bold consecration to you. I pray, Lord, for all of us who are half-hearted in our faith, that today we leave here with a new understanding that as I spend time with you, as I spend time with God's people, I will be experiencing the fullness of God. For those that have come with law and legalism, free them today to experience the grace and the joy of serving God. Let this new thing happen in their life today. If there's anyone here that has come for the first time and said, Terry, I do want to know Jesus. I pray this prayer. Lord, here I am. Forgive me. I receive your love and sacrifice for my sin. I will begin to walk this journey, learning how to reflect Jesus as I attach to him, as I worship him. And let that be done today. So Lord, we thank you for the victory in Jesus today. And we praise you. And Lord, this is the prayer for everyone standing here. I pray that they begin to see the 30 the 60, the hundredfold fruit in their life. And let there be testimony of God's glory. Now we pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you all. Listen. Our prayer team's available. If there's a need for other prayer, feel free to do that. Thank you all. Listen. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. You are loved and valued. Thank you for being here today. God bless you all. Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for watching our service and being a part of this. I personally hope, and all of us from Jubilee Fellowship Church, hope that God connected in your life and met you right where you are this weekend in this service. Like I said at the beginning, just because you're watching online does not mean that you're not part of the whole of the community of what our church is doing, and we are so grateful that you're a part of this. So before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.